Good day YouTubers and welcome to the 10th video in the series on Central Moreton Bay. In this video I'm going to talk about St Paulina. Unfortunately if you're watching these videos just to get fishing marks, this one's going to be a little bit of a disappointment because I've only got a couple of spots here and a couple of general areas. St Paulina is more of a spot these days where you're going to take your family for a pleasant day out in the bay. It used to be a terrific fishing spot, caught some really nice fish there but now it's a green zone and you can't fish in most of the spots that I used to go to. I can give you a few spots but not a lot. Its main claim to fame is its historical aspect as a prison island and quite a fascinating history it has. We'll roll the clips and I'll have a talk about what there is to do and see on the island and then we'll get into some of the possible fishing areas that are left after you take out the green zone. Moving southward from Mud Island brings us to St Helena. Back in the day, everyone I spoke to talked about fishing at Green Island. Quite a few talked about fishing at Mud Island, but I don't recall talking to anyone that ever told me that St Helena was a good fishing spot. That's a bit strange because personally I found it to be a brilliant fishing spot. Of course, back in the day I was a bit selfish too because I didn't tell anyone what a brilliant fishing spot it was. So I guess the fact that no one talked about it kept it a little bit more protected than normal. It's not that no one ever fished it or that you didn't see other boats there. It's just that you saw more boats at the other islands. But that's all very irrelevant now because years ago they made St Helena and its surroundings into a green zone so you just can't fish there anymore. Nevertheless, there are still some good reasons for going to St Helena, so that's what this video is mainly going to be about. When they originally built St Helena, it was intended to be a quarantine station for people coming into the colony. And given the current COVID situation, you've got to wonder whether these guys weren't really ahead of their time. All joking aside, the long duration of the voyages in those days and the cramped conditions that the convicts were shipped in really did promote plague ships. Back in 1790, three ships set out for the colony and they had 930 men on board. 261 of them died on the trip out and 50 more after landing, all from typhus. So you can understand why quarantine was considered so important back then. After the construction of the quarantine station was underway, they decided that the Brisbane jails were getting too crowded and that they needed more facilities to house prisoners. So in order to solve the prisoner problem, they took over the buildings that were already there for the quarantine station, converted them to house some prisoners, shipped some prisoners over there, had them build more buildings and roads and other infrastructure, and eventually they had quite a little industry on that island. They grew sugar cane, they made sails and boots and candles and book binding. They farmed on the island so that they could provide milk, meat and other foods. They had a bakery and quite a few other little industries there. In fact, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I did read somewhere that the prison actually ran at a profit. I do remember that they certainly did win prizes for the quality of some of the things that they did produce. And that all kept going until the island closed as a prison. I find it quite strange to read how they viewed prisoners in those days. Apparently the magistrates had the view that it was a prisoner's right to try and escape and that it was the warder's job to frustrate that attempt. Basically pretty much how we view POWs these days. Now, given that that was a prevailing view in the day, it's not all that surprising that the warders came up with an idea of their own. In order to discourage escapes, they started feeding the sharks in the area to bring them around the island and let the prisoners see this so that they were in turn discouraged from trying to swim to the mainland. It's a bit of a long swim, but I guess a good swimmer could do it. But swimming wasn't all that common in those days, so there probably weren't that many strong swimmers around. And everyone seemed to have a pretty genuine fear of being eaten by anything. So seeing the sharks being fed would have been pretty much of a discouragement. There were a few prisoners that built a makeshift raft and tried to escape that way. There was one guy that tried to use a bathtub as a boat, but I don't believe there were all that many escapes, at least not successful ones. I took a break from recording this and just pulled out one of my old books to brush up on some of the history, and this is what I got. The prison itself ran for 65 years and I was correct in what I said before, it was actually quite a profitable operation. 
The superintendent and the warders lived very well, certainly a lot better than the prisoners that they guarded. They won a lot of prizes for the quality of their livestock at the RNA show. They sent some of their olive oil over to Italy for a competition and they actually won that as well for the quality of it. The superintendent loved his garden and he won a lot of prizes for it. It was widely regarded as one of the best gardens in Queensland. Of course, he didn't do anything about it. The prisoners did all the maintenance on it. I think for the superintendent and the warders, life wasn't all that bad there. They did complain about the isolation. They didn't like being away from the mainland and its entertainment opportunities. But nevertheless, compared to the prisoners, their life was damn good. St Helena operated as a prison between 1885 and 1932 and another of its claims to fame was that it operated the very first passenger tram service in Queensland. There's very little evidence of that remaining on the island but it was in fact there and it was very innovative at the time. It wasn't all roses though. Unspecified administrative problems were cited as one of the reasons for closing it in 1932, but that was also a time of an awakening social conscience about the way prisoners were being treated, and it coincided with the introduction of prison reform around Australia. So no doubt there was a lot more to it than just administrative problems. So with all that and whatever other reasons there were, the prison was closed and unfortunately, the buildings were dismantled and the materials shipped back to the various government bodies that could recycle them. Now there are only 7% of the original buildings left on the island and most of them are not intact. It's hard to blame the people that were in charge back then. Life was a lot tougher, even day to day living was often a struggle. Reusing existing material did make things a bit easier and obviously saved some money as well. Nevertheless, it's a great pity that they didn't consider just how interesting we would find it to look back in time and just see how things were back then. I'm not one to stand in the way of progress. I don't believe in stopping progress. But given that nothing's been done on that island since then, it wouldn't have hurt to have left those buildings intact. It's a bit of a shame. I do understand the need to recycle. Yeah, it's just a shame that that wasn't left intact. That was the saddest thing I found about it when I walked around the area. These days you can't just go and have a look around the island. It's been segregated. There's parts of the island that you're allowed to access and other parts that you can only access as part of a tour group. I think that's probably to generate some money to maintain it, which is not a bad thing. Since we just went ashore and wandered around by ourselves, we didn't get the history lesson that would come with a tour, but it was quite interesting nevertheless. I did some research online and you can take your own boat over there and join up with a tour which is considerably cheaper than getting a boat from the mainland as part of the tour cost. So if you're interested in the history and you want to take the family somewhere in the bay, go and have a look at it. I think it's really worthwhile. Certainly a pleasant atmosphere over there anyway. At least these days, I guess it wasn't back in the day, depending on the reason you were there. And just a few other points about it. It is a national park these days, so you can't take your pets in there. Any domestic animals aren't allowed in national parks. There's a museum on the island now. I'm pretty sure that wasn't there when I walked around the island. I don't recall seeing any indication that there was a museum there. I'm pretty sure that's something new. But if you're part of the tour, you can go through that. If you'd like to see some of the history of early Moreton Bay settlement, it should be a good day out to take the family, and if you take them over in your own boat, it's not all that expensive, really. We went in on the northern side of the jetty and waded the shore from there. We walked around the island for a little bit, uh, maybe an hour or two, and came back to the boat. If you take the tour, it's a three-hour tour, so just keep an eye on the tide so that you don't end up being high and dry when you get back or having to swim out a long way. They don't feed the sharks there anymore, but you just never know. In case you're interested in going, I'll put a link in the description for the tours. It's only $35 for a family group, $35 for two adults and two children aged 4 to 14 years is really a pretty good price. And just bear in mind, it's only $35 if you go there in your own boat. It's up to $110 if you don't have your own boat. So if you look at the arithmetic the right way, you can tell your wife that you saved $75 by buying a boat. I'll leave it up to you guys to decide whether it's something you want to visit or whether you just want to motor on past and go fishing at Mud or Green Island. 
And speaking of Green Island, that's the next place we're going to look at. Now just before we leave St Helena, I'll just mention that the yellow line here marks the drop off area that I used to fish between the 5 and 6 metre marks or thereabouts and that part of the yellow line is outside the green zone. Now, I don't want to encourage you to go too close to the green zone because you will get booked. Remember I've said it before, don't throw your bait into the green zone even if your bait is outside the green zone you will get booked. Stay well clear of the green zone, but there is the potential to fish that. I haven't fished it since the green zone was there, so I have no idea if it will even work anymore. This mark here is supposedly a wreck. I haven't verified it. I will one day when I'm going past. I'll have a bit of a search around and just verify if there is a wreck there and get its location exactly. But it is a publicly known mark or a wreck, so hopefully it is still there and if you guys want to have a look for it, you might get lucky and get some fish. It is outside the green zone and it is far enough outside the green zone that you won't get into trouble, provided the mark is accurate, of course. Back in the day, I didn't know Finn's wreck was there, but I did fish quite close to it. And this is a shaded relief map of the bottom contours in that area. I didn't have any GPS marks back in the day and I'm just going by the look of the island and the bottom contours but I'm pretty sure this is the area that I used to fish. It's inside the green zone now so you can't fish it anymore but there may be an alternative that I'll talk about in a couple of slides. In this relief map the red areas are the shallower areas. You can see that where the contour lines are really close together that's a sharp drop off and the sky blue line is roughly where I used to fish, just south of that drop off. It was a good spot when the tide was running. I don't recall it being all that good on the flat of the tide. It was a little bit shallower than I normally fished. I think it was around about three or four metres of water. As I recall, there were more snags there than I normally like to fish, but the rewards were worth it. But as I said, you can't fish there anymore, so it is inside the green zone, you will get caught, don't do it. However, looking at the bottom contours when I was doing this video made me wonder whether the areas that I've marked here might be worth a look. The drop-offs aren't nearly as steep, so I don't expect they're going to be the same quality of fishing that the drop-off in closer to the island offered, and probably not in the same tides, but it may be worth just having a quick sound around there if you're going past and see if you can see any fish. If there's no fish on the sounder, there's no fish there, don't bother stopping. But just looking at it, I just thought maybe this might be an opportunity that's outside the green zone. Although, as I said, it's not a steep drop off, I don't think it would be as good. Well, that's it for this video. I thank you for taking the time to watch it. I'm sorry if you're a little bit disappointed there's no more fishing spots in this video. But that's it, the government made that a green zone, so those fishing spots have disappeared forever. On the brighter side, the next episode is going to look at Green Island, and there's a lot more fishing to be done around there, and I will be giving you some more spots to check out, and some hints on how to fish them. As always, if you'd like to see more of my videos, you can have a look at my YouTube channel. Don't forget to click that like button, comment, and subscribe if you'd like to see more of these videos. Until next time, good fishing.